if they would have showed me intake, I would have never sold drugs ever in life. They would have just showed me intake. Intake is the closest thing to slavery that you will ever be a part of. You can't hold this back. 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 So when I got the call from the folks at Be Woke Back Vote to do a series of interviews to encourage folks to vote, uh, my next guest was one of the first folks on my list. And when I say one of the first, literally in the top three because uh, of his unique story, not only being a comedian, but also uh, being someone who is very socially conscious in his comedy. Uh, comedy is all about uh, making folks think, forcing them to actually uh, own up to some serious truths. And so uh, Ali Sadiq often does that on the stage and we're certainly glad to have him here. What's up, Doc? How you doing, brother? I'm all good to see you. Oh, man, it's all good. It's always a pleasure to do anything with you, anything. What also helps, you, he, he's based in H-Town. So Definitely, it, it, it also proud. Being, being a Houston native, that also helps. That, that, you know, you got to have a little, little sugar on it. You know, you can, people call you for a certain reason. Growing up was voting, was community engagement. Was that a part of your life? Nah, I, I didn't really hear a lot of people talking about voting growing up. It wasn't a, a conversation. It was always who in office, but you never knew how they got there. They just like, see, they didn't put this man in office. And I'm like, who is they put him in office? That's all I used to hear was they put this man in office. They ain't nobody in office for us. Okay, but so, so how it was, did all, they get it was there? always they. They. But they was never, it, it, it was never defined. It was never defined. And, and, and did, did anybody even own up to, I'm part of they? No. It was just a they in office, they ain't gonna let us, them, look what they did, them folks there. It was never like, who are them, they, and those? Who are these people? And when you grow, I, I didn't even find out about voting, which is, which is oddly enough how important voting was, I found out about how important voting was in prison. Dead serious. Dead serious. Old man in prison say, hey, brother, you ought to try to persuade your people to vote for Ann Richards because she can't run again. It's her last term. Now, if she win, then all she going to do is just steal money. You know what I'm saying? While she getting out of office. Now, if Bush get in office, boy, ain't nobody going on. The first thing a politician said, I'm gonna be tough on crime, tough on crime. And Richards. <laughs> so I didn't really understand the concept. How old were you? I was in jail, so I was 19. You were 19, you went in at what age? 19. 19, mm -hmm. you went in jail for? Drug trafficking. So you go in jail, and 19 years ago, between car games and family get-togethers, all that sort of stuff. And I'm in them streets. I'm in the streets hustling. Um, and what's crazy, your neighborhood, your environment pushes you to the streets very early because in our neighborhood, this is the only place that you hear that you got to get out of here at 18. So in your mind, you 13 when you hear this. You got five more years until right. you on your own. So is school important? or hustling to get some bread because at 18, I got to get out this lady house and I don't know where I'm going or what I'm going to do. So it wasn't go to college. It wasn't get a job, go to the, go to the army, go to the military. Mm -hmm. It was, you got to be out this house. Got to be out this house. You go to prison at 19. Yeah. Sentence for how long? 15 years. And you're, for the first time you were hearing this old man talk about voting. Mm -hmm. What did you say? What's that? What's that? And why does that make a difference? What did he say? And he broke the Ann Richards thing down to me. About they gonna be stealing money. He said, and his thing was about people getting out. He said, man, a lot of people gonna be here that's not gonna get out because Bush is gonna come in and he gonna set off all these people's sentences just to show that he's tough on crime to get favor with whoever put him in office. <clears throat> Made sense to me once he broke it down. Then I start reading about voting in the importance of voting, just talking with them. Because these are men who probably marched for voting, probably something went wrong in their life, they still ended up in this place. But there was a lot of knowledgeable people there, and I just hung with the old cats that had all this information. Hey, man, 
when you get out, this is what needs to happen. This is what's not in the community. This is the reason why you're here. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't see it like this, you know? And I'm like, man, wow. That was, that was, that was deep, what you just said. And I'm still young and wild in there. And I didn't understand that these old cats, because I was one of the only young people that was still listening. Like, you could still talk to me. I was still, huh, what you say? It, I wasn't at this point where what you said didn't have no weight to me. Like, I, I wasn't a lost cause. So they came up with this plan unbeknownst to me. I didn't find out about it until it, they had already accomplished their goal. The man said that I was so wild on this unit, dude named Blackshirt, he said, we can't got together, we say once we get him, then we get the rest of the youngsters. You know what I'm saying? And he said, when I said that, you was on the wreck yard fighting when I said it. He said, like, he said look at him, the little wild crazy one. That's what we got to get. So a, so a group of old men old men in prison said, if we break him yeah. and put him back together and mold him, it's going to be a domino effect. He'd get everybody else. Is that what happened? That's what happened. Six different units, though. They didn't know what they started. Every time they moved me from a, a unit, I changed the unit. They would just have to move me. And so when you have somebody who so powerful that I'll never forget it, you was at the Million Man March. Yep. I'm in prison. We supporting from prison and showing unity because I put together a plan. This guy named Lewis, Lewis McKenzie. I, he was the first person I told. I woke up, I say, Lewis, man, they got this Million Man March, and we not gonna be a part of it. We can't be a part of it but we gotta show some type of solidarity. I said, man, I, I, don't, I don't want nobody black to go in that, in, that, um, in that cafeteria. On that day, October 16th, I don't want nobody in that cafeteria. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner, I think we can feed each other. I think we can do it. He said, boy, you pull that off, they gonna move you. And I said, I think I can do it. And we did it. And I think that was the only time I ever shed a tear in prison. Cause I got up that morning and walked on that rec yard and I didn't see from six different buildings, I didn't see one black inmate walk into that cafeteria. Even the people who was cooking the food didn't eat in there. And I knew they found out about it because on that, on that day, you know, you got people working in the kitchen. Spaghetti was on the menu and they changed it from spaghetti to fried chicken. And it wasn't because, oh, it's a black thing. That's the only time that you get a whole piece of chicken and it'll be another month before you get it. And the funniest thing, Halim, his brother named Halim, he was cooking and he had stole out the kitchen all this chicken. He said, now you told me not to eat it in there. <laughs> he said nothing about taking it back to this chicken, to this, to this bringing it back to this block. and. It was so powerful that the Hispanics came and said, hey, next time y'all do that, we are gonna do it with you. Because that was the only way we could show some strength. You gotta throw away 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars worth of food. And you gotta explain why they ain't eating. What's going on, why they ain't eating? We, we spent every dollar we had to feed each other. And when people was coming out from the fields, it was amazing to see them turn away from that child hall and go back to their blocks. And brothers had already made spreads, like, just come over here, we got you. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we got you. And that was a big thing to me. Then I moved, I got moved. Then I got to another unit, they was riding. Every other week they was riding. And I was like, nah, we can't live like this. Y'all fighting behind nothing. And I was so sarcastic. I was like, hey man, this is what we, we this is what we're not gonna do. We're not gonna let them keep gassing us, you know what I'm saying, because y'all wanna fight. Next person put their hands on somebody here that's black, you're gonna have to deal with a lot of us. You're gonna have to deal with a lot of us. And the Muslim brothers was like, he's already told y'all what's gonna happen. We not doing this no more. Ain't no more being locked down and being further locked down. Like that it didn't make sense. So I think I was one of the youngest coordinators inside the institution. And the biggest thing was Monday Night Football was when the Crips and the Bloods that was in Hondu, Texas on Torres unit met every Monday and exchanged books 
right before Monday Night Football. And it was a mandate on Torres Unit. And everybody know this, that was on Torres Unit at that time. If you was under the age of 22 years old. Now, did you create that? Yeah. If you was under the age of 22 years old, from the age of 18 to 22 years old, you were not allowed to fight on this unit at all. You had to go to school. If you did not go to school, we're going to beat the shit out you until you go to school. So you choose it. It's on you. Because it's the point. You can't keep doing the same act and going back into the world. Because I'm... I was one of the young people that was sent here to this unit with the old people, because I was around old school cats. I came from Ellis 1, Ellis 2, Darrington unit, Bill Clemens, and my mindset was, you're not gonna be here forever, so you got to start preparing yourself in here for out there. It's no getting out and then start the race. No, everybody else is already running. So when people say these reform things or what we gonna do once somebody get out. You have to change the mindset of the individual in there. I knew me, this is not the place for me. I knew that, I was like, if they would've showed me intake, I would've never sold drugs ever in life. If they would've just showed me intake. Intake is the closest thing to slavery that you will ever be a part of. What is it? It's when they book you into the prison. You're stripped down naked. Your place, man, first of all, the trip there is the, is the, it's the same trip as the ship. They take, they, they replace- As a slave ship. They replace the ship with a bus. So you on a bus, you shack up to somebody else. If they gotta go to the restroom, you gotta go to the restroom. Mm -hmm. They gotta do number two, you gotta stand there. If they gotta do number one, you there with them. You shack up to this person. You get off the bus, you shack, you, they unshackle you, they put you through this thing, they strip you down naked. And they got this thing where they call, they want you heel or toe. So you naked and your toes are touching the man's heels in front of you. So that's easily that your private area is touching and somebody's right behind you. So now they shave your head down bald. Now open your mouth. They detox you. Same like when you saw on slavery, they throw that flower and they detox you, bathe you, go in your mouth. You not already bathed and been shaved. They still go in your mouth, go in your anal, lift up, cough up, everything. Then they house you. They give you a number. And this number is branded into your brain. It's bra this, I know this number better than I know my social security number. Your inmate number. Yeah, and I've, and I've tried to forget it. One time I thought I did forget it. And it is? 679346. You're known by that, not your name. Not your name. You say it, you say it every time you move it. That's your, that's your identity, 679346. I've been out 20 years, 679346. It kills me that I even know it. It kills me not even know it, man. It's just, a, it's um, a scar, like when I, when I hear other people talk about, like I heard Cat Williams say it, on a show, I got 19 felonies. Why are you glorifying that? But you've never been in jail, so that's why you glorifying 19 felonies. Well, he felonies. said that in an interview with, with uh, Frank and Wanda, he said, well, no, I, he said, I've been in jail, but I haven't been in prison, as if that was a... Like, that's a good thing. Why even having 19 felonies? Because you have people looking up to you, and they think that that's the way to go. That's why it took me, I've been doing stand-up 20 years. It took me 17 years for I even do one story about prison. Because I didn't want people to think I was some one-trick pony. Oh, all he has been to jail, and that's it. So then you got Meek Mills come out, crying about being in jail for five months because um, you willying down the street in New York on a, on, a, on a dirt bike. And then you talking about you the voice for people who had no voice. You're not the voice for me. Who the fuck are you? You ain't got one scar, not one mental scar, not one physical scar, not one internal scar from that place, because you was in jail. You was on probation. And then what you had people saying, free Meek Mills and do not give you this, this, this glory. But what you were doing, my friend, was incorrect. If that lady wanted to violate you, somebody who was on parole, if that lady wanted to violate you, she could have violated you every time she saw you smoking weed in the video. Every time you was out of town without permission. If she was against you, but see, that's not what you, that's not what you going to say to the people. So you on Lester Holt talking about you the voice for who? Not for me. 
And I really did it. You ain't did nothing. You served how long? I served six on a 15. And then walked the rest on the street with a, and when you walk on the street with it, it's even more detrimental because you don't want nobody to know your name. You don't want nobody to know nothing about you. You move, cause somebody can easily say this. Ali did something to me, and now it's my job to prove that I didn't. Guilty Now you want to financially strap me? You want to financially strap me to, to fight that I didn't do something just because somebody decided that they didn't like me, or they or, or I said something they didn't like, or some girl liked me that he, it, it, whatever the excuse may be. Now I got the fight. You gonna just come pick me up. Excuse my daughter is in school, Excuse that everything that I'm doing in my life, you just gonna uproot me and put me back in a in a cage. And I'm not and I'm not I'm not for that. It see it, that place creates a, a type of human being that people are really not prepared for. I understand, and it's not fictitious with with me. If you choose to accuse me of something wrong, I'm probably gonna hold court in the street. And you're gonna have you gonna it's nothing that you can do to me because I understand who I am in when, I, when, the, when the odds are not in my favor. Even in that, in that place, officers knew, hey, if we cross him, he's going to be a handful because he's already made his declaration. Hey, man, before I let y'all take anything from me, I will die in here as a man if I let you take an inch from me. Let's go for inmate, let's go for officer, and whoever try to buck the system. Because now you done created, a, you took a nonviolent offender, you put him in a, a violent place, and you think that I'm not going to become a, a formidable opponent? No, I'm going to just galvanize to the place that I'm at. I'm going to just, I'm going to start to act like the place that I'm in until somebody pull my hand and say, young man, you don't belong here. I just want to just, nah, we ain't got to talk right now. I just want to let you know. Out of everybody here, I've been here 27 years. You don't belong here. And we'll talk after you calm down. What you mean I don't belong here? He said, man, I saw you when you came in that gate. And I didn't say nothing about something weak about you, nothing. I knew you didn't belong here because you still got light in your eyes. I said, what? He said, you still got light in your eyes. man." I watched you one day on the wreck yard, man. You were just happy. You was by yourself walking around out there happy. I say, that little brother still got it. He, you not no hardened criminal. He said, I guarantee you, everything you did, you was with somebody. Everything you did, you was with somebody. Everything I did, I was, did it by myself. I was hardened by the streets, and I know you not like that. And when somebody talked to you and you your father didn't really give you good conversation, you know, so you, you, now you're talking to like somebody that's like your grandfather and he's an old man. He really, he real live got your best interest at hand. I want you to get out of this place and be what you're supposed to be. Cause this ain't you, my friend. He said, just, just watch. If you just change the narrative of how you walk around here, watch how many people come to you. Everybody gravitates toward. We like you and we don't even know you. That's the crazy part. We like you and don't even know you. And it happened. I was just two years in, I came from this wild, crazy person to walking out. And I remember the day I said, man, what y'all in here mad for? Ain't nobody going home and slammed my door. They was like, <laughs> what? I was like, and they was like, why you come out here and say that? It's Saturday. Don't nobody go home on Saturday. Y'all still mad? <laughs> It's over. Sometimes you got to start enjoying the weekend, brother. <laughs> and we here. And every day I, I had this whole thing. I would just wake up and today is going to be a better day than tomorrow. And I would just challenge people. Do you know that um, in the Civil Rights War that more people um, shitted on themselves to death than, than um, got killed by bullets? Dude, like, that ain't true. Well, look it up. We can argue all day about it. <laughs> I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start an argument about something. I hate. They know I hate the Cowboys, so I'm making posters. Likewise, I'm making posters and clipping stuff. I'm I'm messing with folks all day. I got nothing to do. 
but make people happy. Because this is my job in here. If I got nicknames for people that they got, they like, I don't even like my nickname, but everybody <laughs> know it. Big Hand Rick. And it's like his hands was huge. And I could be sitting across the room, and I'm like, come on, Rick, all that back massage. And he's like, man, I ain't even do nothing to you. I'm way over here. I'm like, and they're like, Big Hand Rick, man, stop touching on that man. <laughs> like, and he ain't even touch me. But it's just, I'm going to create a better avenue. It was like what I wanted in my neighborhood. You know, I, I grew up wanting a lot of activities in my neighborhood that was in close proximity. You know, my mom wasn't always there, so I didn't always have a ride to places. And, you know, you want to be able to walk down the street and get to something that's some food for your soul in your community. You know, you know, I relish, you know, the days of being in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and when I had to go out there and live with my people, they had actually black-owned corner stores. My uncle owned one. My uncle Donald owned a cleaners and a um and a corner store. And he he um he a city councilman down there now. And it's like that was big for him. He was like, "Yo, man, you got to own some. Got to own some." His wife was named Louise. It always killed me. I, I used to call him George Jefferson. His <laughs> name was Donald because <laughs> his wife was named Louise. And that was big to see my family own and stuff. And it just cultivated what my dad told me. My dad, it, he, not a lot, he didn't say a lot of good stuff, but the three things that he did give me, play chess so you'll be a thinker. You don't have to work for nobody. He told me that, I said, you don't have to work for nobody. The same energy that you put into, for somebody else, you can put that same energy into it for yourself. And then he'll go into his field. See, they talking about black people don't want to work. Black people just don't want no job. You know what I'm saying? We don't work for nobody else. We want our own stuff. That's it. Give me my own stuff. I come to work every day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> he going to go to his own spiel. And like I don't work for anybody. And even in, in both sides, in, in, in crime, I didn't work for nobody. I was, I was a, a street pharmaceutical rep. And, <laughs> and then now, you know, I do I do stand up and this I haven't had a job since 1999. I got out in 97. Late 97 going in 98, and I was hell-bent on not working for nobody. I used to sell suits. And um, in Sharpstown, I worked in this place called Sharpstown Mall in a spot called Mosa. And I worked there as a, it's, it's crazy, Reginald Ballard was the person who gave me my shot because I went to his um, store for a whole week until he gave me a job. Because in my mind said, I'm out. I need clothes. What better place to work in at a man's apparel store? So I went in. I said, hey, man, y'all hiring? He said, man, we not hiring. Came back the next day. I said, hey, man, y'all hiring? He said, man, I told you we wasn't hiring. I said, man, I don't know. Somebody could got fired. I don't know. <laughs> so so I, um, I waited a couple of days, and I went in on the weekend. And I guess my face was familiar to him. And it was super busy. And he was like, say, man, we need some mock necks. And he just, I didn't know what a mock neck was. And he pointed to me. And I just went to the back of the stock room. I just went back there and was like, um, my man say he needs some mock necks. <laughs> and this dude just handed me a stack of, I didn't even know what a mock neck was at all. This must have been something new that it just came out. So I just went, I handed a stack of mock And then for the rest of the day, I was just folding clothes and just helping people, taking stuff to the register and just moving around. I was sitting there all day. So at the end, he closed the store and he was like, man, we had a fantastic day, man. My man right here was, man, you don't work here? I'm like, hey, <laughs> hey, man, I've been here all day. I went and got mock necks, everything. I ain't been on no lunch or nothing. And he hired me. I think I'm the only person ever hired on a Sunday. Be like me, be woke, vote.